Hello and welcome to this author interview. This is Howard Bachner, once again, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. Uh, and I'm joined by Jay Butler today, Deputy Director for Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control. Welcome, Jay. Thank you, Howard. It's good to be here. So uh, we're going to focus on what I think will become uh, a challenging issue. Uh, I'm, I'm quite convinced that we're finally uh, mo moving beyond struggles with testing and that testing will roll out um, uh, this week to more and more people. And I think there's going to be a great deal of complexity around how to interpret those tests. So we're going to focus uh, on this issue for uh, the next 20 or 30 minutes. But before I start, Jay, uh, you have a lot of degrees, board certified in medicine, pediatric, and infectious diseases. I'm impressed. I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> And, um, and I'm finding that to be true in this situation, too. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that it's becoming challenging. And in, in many parts of the country, it is challenging now. And I want to acknowledge that and just thank our frontline clinicians that are, are really dealing with this issue and compassionately doing their best to take care of patients that are sick with COVID-19. Yeah, I know. It's, it feels good to be a JAMA. We've tried to really help uh, people understand what's going on. But uh, for me, the real the real heroes are the healthcare workers uh, who are providing so much extraordinary care around the world, and I think coming to the U.S. So, Jay, let's start with some basic questions about uh, the testing. What's the most common testing that's currently available? In the United States, the test that's most commonly run, and really the only one that's widely available, is a polymerase chain reaction. Over the past two weeks, that's become increasingly available, starting with the public health labs around the country. The capacity is now present in 84 different public health labs uh, in around the country, and that provides in-state testing in all 50 states and in the District of Columbia. More recently, there's also been a number of commercial labs that have come online to be able to do the testing. Additionally, a number of academic centers are now able to run FDA-approved testing using slightly different PCR platforms. Now, if you, uh, I'll, I'll um, dispense with positive predictive value because I think that confuses people, but if you do a, a hundred tests on a hundred people who have disease, how many times will the PCR be positive? Well, at this point in time, the PCR is probably the gold standard. We do have viral culture data available. Uh, I think it's safe to assume that the likelihood of a positive test reflecting either infection or past infection is extremely high. The data on sensitivity, of course, is much more limited. Now, this may be frustrating to those of us who really like to know the specifics right. of how to interpret the test results, but it's important to keep in mind, we're talking about a virus that we didn't know existed three, only three months ago. Uh, we go back uh, 12, 13 weeks, we were all getting ready for the holidays. We had not heard of COVID-19. Uh, coronavirus was something we learned about in our training. We trained before 2003. We knew of coronaviruses primarily as a type of virus that caused colds. If you uh, remember 2003, we certainly learned about SARS. That's a uh, outbreak of a coronavirus illness that was quite severe, but was basically contained over a period of months after the initial outbreak. And then more recently, of course, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, emerged. But that's been an issue that very few of us in the United States have had to deal with. Now, if uh, someone has a runny nose and a cough, feels some respiratory symptoms, early in the course, will they be test positive? You know, the question of when the test becomes positive is one of those unknowns, because the assumption is that if you're test positive, you're also then more likely to be infectious. The data that we've seen so far suggests that the level of infectiousness is greatest early after the onset of symptoms, which is a little different than the SARS coronavirus. There's at least some anecdotal reports to suggest that transmission could occur before onset of symptoms, but the data are still very limited for that. Of course, that has big implications in terms of how well we can really slow the spread of the virus. So the expectation is if someone has symptoms, they're, they're likely to have a positive test. 
Well, if they're assuming we're uh, using in that scenario the assumption that they're infected with the COVID-19 virus. Okay. The majority of people who've been tested nationally, looking at the numbers that are available, come back test negative because there's really nothing very specific about the symptoms of COVID-19. As the virus is spreading in more and more communities, the value of the travel history also becomes more limited. Right now, if we look around the world and what's, what's going to be the travel history that's most helpful, Europe is really the hot spot. We are seeing a remarkable number of cases, particularly in Italy, yeah. but also in Germany, France, Spain, and Switzerland. Now, um, let's talk about the individual in the U.S. who's not a healthcare worker, because I think we'll, we'll return to them. Some of the scenarios may be the same. But say someone uh, at a place of work develops uh, runny nose, cough, and fever, and, and they are test negative. Uh, can they come back to work? Well, the question that always comes up is how smart is it to go to work when you have respiratory right. tract symptoms? Because we know that influenza can be spread in work sites. We know that rhinovirus, any number of the, the viruses that uh, cause what uh, we mostly know as the respiratory crud can be transmitted in work sites. So, of course, our recommendations are always, if you're sick, stay home. Now, I think we would both admit that we don't always do that. Right. But that recommendation is more important now than ever because of COVID-19. The individual who develops particularly mild respiratory tract symptoms may not immediately know if they have COVID-19, do they have uh, some other respiratory tract virus, but it's really important to symptomatically stay home if you have evidence of some sort of respiratory illness. Now for the I, I recognize also it's going to be challenging as we uh, get into uh, pollen season as well. So taking temperature is also an important part of that assessment. Now for the now let's move to the person uh, who who has symptoms can get tested and is test positive. How long should they stay home for, and when can they be allowed to go back to work? Yeah, that's uh, a question that we are continuing to dig into, and spent a good bit of the weekend reviewing some of the available data. Currently, our recommendation is that people who are positive and isolated either in a healthcare setting or self-isolating at home, and it's important to remember that most people do not require hospitalization, right. so uh, self-isolation is, is an important intervention. Our recommendation is that they have two negative swabs at least 24 hours apart, and that would be collected after resolution of symptoms. We also recognize that the availability of testing uh, can still be limited. And even though there's availability of reagents, increasing availability of different platforms that allow the RNA extraction, the testing oftentimes may be limited looking down the road by various global supply chain issues. So there very well may be a number of people who are going to be managed based symptomatically. So as we look at the uh, evolution of the illness. We're currently looking at the possibility of defining a certain period of time after the onset of illness and then at least probably 72 hours after resolution of fever. A few parts of the country where the availability of the testing has become uh, more limited as the demand has increased have actually uh, gone forward with some of those recommendations. Here at the CDC, we're looking at uh, those data and we want to be able to define what are some of the guidelines that can be applied nationally. And I, it's a good point, to, good opportunity for me to uh, remind everybody to go to cdc.gov slash COVID-19 because pretty much every day there is some update in the guidance. And this, this is one of those critically important issues that we want to continue to push the information out as quickly as we're able to based on the emerging data. So uh, someone's ill on Monday, uh, tested on Wednesday, is positive. Um, you're not defining 14 days after that test positive, they can go back to work. It's more complicated than that. Ah, did I lose Jay? Yeah, well, that broke up a little bit ill about 48 hours is test positive, 
is isolating uh, at home. The question is, when can they go back to work? Uh, sorry, I'll start. Uh, there was a drop in oh. the sound. So, so, yes. so someone's sick on Monday. They're, they're tested on Wednesday. And then they're, be they're better by Saturday. Um, uh, can they go back to work after 14 days from that Monday? Or you're not using a time period. You're using resolution of symptoms and being test negative. So... They're, they're better on that Saturday. They have a negative test on Sunday. Can they go back to work on that Monday? Or is there yeah. a minimum time period that they should be out of work? Yes, the hypothesis we've been looking at is uh, 14 days. Okay. Uh, the question that's been raised is, can that number be reduced? Because it certainly would be much better if that number can be reduced. The one caveat I'll add in that, besides the fact that uh, these are not yet official guidelines, is that someone who's a healthcare worker, yeah. even if they have resolved uh, symptoms, it's still a good idea to wear a surgical mask just to, as an extra measure of precaution to make sure that any respiratory secretions that are even potentially infectious, there's no exposure to people who may be at higher risk. Is there enough data yet to say if someone is test negative before they go back to work or if they go back to work to a hospital, can they still shed vi viruses? That's one of the questions that's come in. Well, certainly we're in the process of looking at how a negative PCR relates to viral load and also the ability to recover a virus. Uh, one of the situations that we've seen a few times is that someone will be negative two times, but if a third swab is collected, they, they might be weakly positive. And by weakly positive, I mean that you run a, a number of cycles, we call this the PCR cycle threshold, uh, and it can be positive. Uh, it's not clear if those are people who are actually infectious. Uh, of course, uh, I think the audience is aware that uh, the PCR is detecting viral RNA. It doesn't necessarily indicate that there is viable virus present in the resp respiratory tract. So in general, it, I think it is going to be uh, safe to go back to work. But uh, a positive test in a situation like that can be uh, very difficult to interpret because we think that it probably doesn't reflect infectivity but we don't know for sure. The, uh, I saw some of the lines of, I think in Colorado, they're doing some drive-by testing. I think that got popular in K Korea. Um, but that, that, that then uses up a lot of tests for people who may not have a lot of disease. What's the recommendation about who should be tested and who shouldn't be tested? Yeah, so the focus really is on people who are symptomatic uh, with evidence of uh, respiratory tract infection, that it's uh, not just be anyone who uh, comes in off the street and is uh, c concerned. I think it's important when talking to patients to help them to understand this is different than a test for HIV or a test for hepatitis C, where much of the message is, please get tested. This is a situation where we're trying to diagnose an acute infection. And we actually do have a resource that may become limited again, limited again, as some of the, uh, the equipment required for running the test or collecting the specimens may come into short supply. So we want to focus on those people who are symptomatic and particularly on people who may be at higher risk of more severe illness, those who are uh, advanced in age, people with underlying uh, heart or lung conditions, and those with diabetes couple other questions. Actually, quite a few have come in around healthcare workers. And I, uh, you know, I've had a lot of emails back and forth, I'm sure you've had, uh, with major academic medical centers. I think they're going to take a lot of advice from their own ID uh, uh, experts. But are any of the recommendations that you've made around general public, you, for example, me or the people I work with, we don't take care of patients, is it different for healthcare workers? Well, the difference for healthcare workers is they have a much higher likelihood of being exposed or exposing people who are at high risk of severe infection. Uh, and that's why, for instance, when we talk about when is it safe to go back to work, the extra precaution of wearing a safety mask if you're a healthcare worker is part of the, the package. Now, again, these are uh, recommendations that are in draft. So I, I want to be very clear that uh, I'm floating concepts out there that people can consider. Because um, the role of the CDC is to provide guidelines that then can be adapted locally. 
And I recognize as a uh, former infection control medical director in a, a hospital that sometimes you have to adapt those guidelines based on your local conditions. Um, now, uh, w even later this week, you know, the time delay between being tested and getting the results is just going to vary where you are. You know, uh, some academic medical centers have developed their own tests. It's still a bit slow in some states. Um, how, how does that uh, affect uh, how much time healthcare workers should take off? Do they really need to wait until they have a negative test if they've been positive? Well, that's one of the reasons why we think it is important to come up with good evidence-based guidelines that could be driven more by symptoms than microbiological findings. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it is uh, a, a it, it consumes some of those resources that are uh, so important for testing. If we have, uh, you know, everyone who has a positive test then needs to have two negative tests in the bank before they go back to work. So that's why these are very important guidelines and ones where we're literally looking at the data daily as we begin to develop some guidelines that can be distributed more broadly. A couple of questions have come up about reinfection, not just uh, that's coming in now, but it's been, it has uh, crossed my desk through different viewpoints or, or emails. Do we know much about reinfection? Someone, uh, you know, someone's infected, they then go home. Can they get reinfected or do they develop some form of immunity? You're probably aware there's been a lot of controversy over the announced UK approach, which was uh, uh, different from what the US is doing or WHO recommendations about allowing a, a fair number of their populace to get infected so they develop immunity. Do we know very much about the person who's infected gets better, goes home? Can that individual get reinfected? Yeah, um, it's important to recognize, again, we're looking at a, a virus that uh, we've only, has only been known to science yeah. really for uh, less than three months now. So the long-term immunity after exposure and infection is virtually unknown. What we know about other corona, well, actually, one of the things we know about COVID-19 is there is an antibody response. Whether or not that's protective or right. not, don't yet know for sure. Based on some of the older coronaviruses, particularly the, uh, the so-called common coronaviruses that cause cold-like symptoms, uh, people develop an antibody response, may have a transient period of immunity, but eventually that immunity rain, wanes and reinfection can occur. Now, there's certain high-risk groups. I, I mean, the older population, comorbid conditions, smokers, respiratory disease. Uh, that's well-defined. But there's two other groups I want to ask you about, and then I'll go to some more of the questions. The first, is there any new data about why younger children to seem to be at such low risk? Yeah, it, at this point in time, there's uh, probably more theoretical data in terms of, you know, like a molecular uh, explanation for uh, the, the for. Uh, some type of ability to contain the infection more quickly than older people, uh, it's really unknown. I think very generally, though, the phenomenon of immune senescence is uh, very significant and that as we age, we are more susceptible to a wide variety of infectious diseases. In the case of the COVID-19 virus and children, it could be also a major part of it is that uh, there's just a very robust, uh, natural, uh, innate immune response so that the virus is contained much more quickly. Now that said, uh, the epidemiology is something that we are examining very closely. We know that if you look at the population that has symptoms, there's a fairly small proportion that have among children that occur among children and children who do have documented infections generally have milder illness. What we don't know is what role children may play in the transmission in the community. It's possible that kids are uh, vectors of infection and that's one of the reasons why there is a very foundational approach to social distancing that's not age-based because while young people may be at lower risk of developing severe illness themselves, they may be capable of transmitting it to those who are at higher risk. 
Right. So uh, really the quarantine, uh, quarantining of the elderly. And, and we've always said, you know, even in a, in a season of flu, that seems to be worse in terms of the number infected or the number of people who ultimately die. Children even then seem to be spared. Um, so children are... Although I will say there, there is one major difference. Uh, the very young do have higher rates of mortality with influenza. And where so far we have not seen that with COVID-19. Okay. Again, the data continue to come in, but uh, that's an interesting difference. Okay. Uh, the other group that people always want to know about, we've, we've had a number of papers on it, are uh, women who are pregnant. Um, can, you, can you say anything about them at this point? Well, you, as people may remember, during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, pregnant women seem to have a uh, really exquisite risk of higher rates of severe illness. And if we look back at some of the uh, earlier data on influenza, it's not entirely unique to 2009 H1N1. Uh, we haven't seen that same type of uh, obvious higher risk among women who are pregnant with COVID-19, but it's important to recognize that there's the broad category of diseases that may limit the pulmonary function, including uh, late pregnancy or morbid obesity, that we don't have a lot of specific data on yet, but certainly are reasons to, to potentially be concerned. Yeah, a, a, a more difficult question. Um, healthcare workers who are pregnant, um, does the CDC, are they providing any advice for them specifically or their employers, or is that something that is going to be employer specific? Yeah, at this point in time, because we don't have clear evidence of higher risk of infection or uh, poor outcomes, uh, or severity of illness among pregnant women, we, we do not have specific recommendations for pregnant healthcare workers. Lots of recommendations from different groups, the CDC uh, uh, and others about gatherings. Uh, someone's commented, CBC, CDC recommends gathering smaller than 50 people. Where does the 50 threshold come from? Do you want to say anything about the size of the gathering or at this point you think it's safer just to say keep gatherings quite small. It was, it was my son's birthday over the weekend, his 30th birthday, and we limited the gathering to six people, and we sat very far apart at the dinner table. But can you say anything about gathering, size of gatherings? Well, Howard, I like your mnemonic there. Six feet and six people makes <laughs> a formula. Um, the, and some of the numbers that are also out there are even as small as uh, 10, which really begins to impact uh, a lot of social gatherings. Uh, of course, you, you know, these numbers are very much influenced by the situation, whether or not uh, a gathering involves people being uh, really elbow to elbow, or is there more space between people? How long does the, the gathering take? But at this point in time, is, uh, given that there's so many unknowns about this new virus, the prudent approach is to defer social gatherings. And more than 10 people is, is a reasonable number. There's uh, no reason to think nine is uh, going to be safe and 10 is not going to be safe. It really depends on a lot of variables. So I think, as you described, uh, it is uh, these are guidelines that hopefully can be helpful to individuals in the public as well as public health agencies in uh, guiding, uh, basically trying to increase social distancing while not creating social isolation. Um, you know, I, I really like the fact that we're connected not just more than six feet apart, but about 600 miles apart <laughs> today, because it shows uh, it's a good example of how we can use technology to be interconnected. So while we may be socially distanced, we're not socially isolated. Yeah, people have been asking me all, all morning, how do I think things have gone and what do I predict? And I said, I won't predict anything. I don't have a crystal ball. But I am incredibly encouraged that, uh, you know, I, I think after the news came from Italy, we, we did our podcast li last week with Mauricio Cerzani. Um, it was alarming. I really feel like just over the last week, the major hospitals, most hospitals around the country, academic medical centers have really, really enhanced their preparation uh, for, uh, you know, the so-called spike that we may see that Dr. Fauci's talked about so much and really increased uh, uh, ICU bed capacity. I, I worry about 
the number of healthcare workers and what it may mean for them. But I, I am convinced that the hospitals are much better prepared now than even a week ago. Yeah, and I think you, you just highlighted something that's really important. When we talk about social distancing, is we want to avoid any unintended consequences. And one of the one examples of, of that is healthcare workers that now need to stay home if their children are out of school, because that can have a significant impact on the workforce. When we talk about hospitals uh, and really the, the whole public health system, it's important to realize that this didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, the, the community mitigation guidelines from the CDC were published in 2017. And the, uh, the graph that I think everyone uh, is now very familiar with, it shows uh, a very high peak in the number of cases and a more smooth peak. That is the goal of community mitigation. And that, that, those data were first generated back uh, in around 2007 and first uh, published. And it's a theoretical model, but it highlights what we're trying to do with community interventions as well as interventions in the healthcare workforce to be able to spread the impact, distribute the impact of the pandemic over as long a period of po as possible to be able to protect infrastructure, particularly the healthcare system. Now, I said we were going to talk just about testing, but Jay, if you, you want to beg off on some more questions, but there there's quite a few that are coming in. I, I think people have liked these podcasts and you're such a remarkable right. source of information. So a couple of the questions now are, are around therapy. I, I would have expected if there were any magic therapies or, or breakthrough therapies, they, they would have gone up on a preprint server. Uh, you know, I know there's a number of clinical trials that are ongoing, um, but, you know, the French have talked uh, about trying to avoid certain types uh, of drugs, for example, anti-inflammatories. The data I've seen uh, is much less clear about that. Can you say anything about treatment or therapies, or, or is it it's something you want to beg off from? Well, our, our reading of the literature, I think, is very similar uh, to yours. There are a number of uh, trials that are underway now. Uh, one of the candidate drugs is remdesivir, right. which is a broad-spectrum antiviral uh, specific to RNA viruses. Uh, there are trials that are ongoing in China, and actually there are trials that are ongoing here in the U.S. as well. The uh, remdesivir is also available under a compassionate use protocol from the FDA. There are, there's also work that uh, is, has started at the NIH looking at the possibility of developing monoclonal antibodies that might be clinically useful. Of course, these are, uh, these are drugs that are not yet FDA approved. Uh, I think we all want to have them uh, in our toolbox as soon as possible. But we also want to make sure that these drugs are going to do uh, benefit and not harm and that uh, they really do have the utility that we hope they will. Now, early last week, I think there were uh, some concerns were raised about so-called so supply, supply chain issues since many of the supplies come from China, whether or not uh, academic medical centers, hospitals, others would run out of supplies. The reagents for the PCR test, do you think there's an adequate supply in the United States? Well, we've tried to address that issue of the global supply chain by broadening the number of PCR platforms that uh, are, can be used to be able to run the COVID-19 analysis. The public health system was based on a, a very specific platform so that it could be standardized in the public health laboratories to make sure that everyone had equipment so that it could be pushed out uh, as quickly as possible. The expansion of the different types of platforms has been one of the ways we've been able to open up the number of testing options and be able to include the commercial labs as well as more and more academic centers. The issue of the global supply chain is one that I know uh, many people have been warning about for yeah. a number of years. And uh, really in many parts of our, our lives were touched by just-in-time inventory and the importance of being able to man maintain that global supply chain. Particularly as many of these products are originating in other countries now, uh, that issue uh, certainly is uh, of, of keen interest and uh, unfortunately uh, we're going to learn very quickly, I believe, how important it is. Just back to some of the clinical questions and then I'll let you go. I know how busy you are and I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time.
Um, some questions about uh, viability of the virus on various surfaces, uh, fruits, packages, vegetables. Uh, how viable in the stool? Can you make any comments about that? Right. Well, there's been uh, laboratory studies that have been published showing that under the right conditions, the, the virus uh, can survive on surfaces for uh, a period of time. If the conditions are just right and the surface is just right for a fairly uh, prolonged period of time, not just minutes to days, but not just minutes to hours, but actually for a period uh, of days. However, I think it's important to look at the epidemiology of how the infection has spread around the world, and particularly early in the pandemic when the vast majority of infections were occurring in China, and they began to spread outside of China to a number of countries, including the United States. It was travelers who first became infected, and then it was their household contacts were the people who uh, became infected in those countries. So, for instance, a, a scenario that's oftentimes described is, well, what about manufactured goods or mail that comes out of China? Is that a risk factor? If that were a prominent mode of transmission, I think very early on, we would have seen more cases that were popping up all around the world in remote locations, rather than having the vast majority of cases linked to travel or then exposure to someone who had traveled and became ill after return. Yeah, it's, it's nice to offer some uh, reassuring, some, some reassuring information. One more clinical question, and I just want to finish up with testing since that's where we started. Um, we've gotten quite a few papers about ACE inhibitors because of the way that uh, the coronavirus acts uh, in that chain. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, any role of uh, ACE inhibitors in treatment, there, there's been some reports of varying types of uh, cardiovascular uh, consequences of disease, and I didn't know if there's any clarity around ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Yeah, a little background uh, on that is it appears that uh, the COVID-19 virus binds to the ACE2 receptor right. in the resp respiratory tract. Um, the, the data on, in terms of the benefits or risk from ACE inhibitors or uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme receptor blockers uh, they're fair, still fairly limited. So uh, certainly we, we at the CDC have no uh, clinical guidelines based on that at this time. Okay, so let's go back to testing where we started. We've been at it for 32 minutes. I try to keep these podcasts to about 35 minutes because I know how busy the people are who I'm talking with. So, so Jay, for the person who's ill, whether they're tested or not, they should stay home. That's always been the recommendation, and they should definitely stay home until they're better. That, that is correct. And of course, that's, we still have a lot of influenza activity uh, in the country right now. And while, uh, unfortunately, that general recommendation is oftentimes ignored, we're, we're seeing a decline in uh, documented influenza infections in many parts of the country. And I, I wonder if some of it is because we're actually uh, having more impact uh, on the, those recommendations. People are actually staying home when they're sick more often now than they might have uh, if we weren't also dealing with COVID-19. Yeah, you know, we have two papers under review. We haven't rushed them, but it was about um, what's happened with flu, I think, in Japan and Korea, and we haven't rushed them because they're not that critical now, and we're so busy. But both of them, both papers indicate a dramatic decline in flu after the, the uh, quarantine began in both of those countries. It's very striking. Um, yeah. And then for the person who's test positive, here it's getting, it's less clear. It's not 14 days from the time they're test positive. It's not two negative tests. It sounds like this is something the CDC is really working to define because this has enormous implications for the workforce, both those who are healthcare workers and who aren't. Can you just summarize uh, the current recommendations for the person who's test positive? Yeah, the, the current recommendation is still focused on microbiological proof of recovery with two swabs collected at least 24 hours apart. We recognize this is a critical question that has to be answered and also needs to be uh, answered not only as quickly as possible, but it's incredibly important that we be right and that it be evidence-based as much as it can be with the continuing evolution of the availability of, of data. So uh, I think the bottom line on that is uh, keep an eye on uh, cdc.gov slash COVID-19. 
Howard, I know uh, AMA will be uh, very helpful in terms of getting that information out to clinicians as soon as possible. Yeah, I know. JAMA has its own coronavirus website uh, landing page, and we we immediately link uh, to the CDC recommendations, which I have found helpful when we get different opinion pieces. And we had one, and I, I realized I didn't think it was consistent with what the CDC said, and so we made the authors change it, or to acknowledge it's different and and then right. why it's different, because I, I do think the CDC is a remarkable source of information. So the next two weeks, Jay, are critical. Do, do you think do you think we will flatten the curve? I think we can. I think we will uh, learn a lot over the next couple of weeks, particularly given the amount of social distancing that is uh, being recommended. Uh, it, I think it's it's going to be a challenging time, though, uh, not only because we'll be uh, assessing the impact of the pandemic, but also assessing the impact of the interventions. Uh, everybody recognizes there's cost and benefits of whatever we do. And we'll be uh, learning a lot over the next few weeks. I hope uh, those lessons are not uh, too painful. I, I just want to reemphasize, I get many questions from friends and colleagues, uh, the, the need uh, to protect the frail elderly. If you're sick, don't visit. Uh, and they really may need help to kind of hunker down in their homes. And if they need help with supplies, we have to figure out as a society how to do it. And the other group is we have to protect healthcare workers. Uh, it, it's just critically important. That if you have a friend or a colleague and he or she is a healthcare worker and you're sick, don't visit them. Uh, it really is important that, that that group of individuals who are so critical to the health and well being uh, in, the, in the coming weeks stay, stay healthy. Uh, this is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of, of JAMA. I've been talking to the Deputy Director for Infectious Diseases, uh, uh, Jay Butler. He's a physician. He's been a, uh, an EIS officer. He worked in uh, Alaska for, for many years and, according to my sources, is enormously, enormously respected uh, around the country for his experience, his intelligence, and his wisdom. Jay, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Howard. It's good to, to speak to everyone who was able to join us today. And I'm signing every email. Uh, stay healthy. And wash your hands. Thanks, Jay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.